And finally, you all are here, so you may all already have one of these, but there are more lectures to come as part of the Tuma Mock Hill lecture series. Um, so we hope to see you at some of the lectures in the future. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce Suzanne Fish and Paul Fish, who have done so much work on Tuma Mock Hill. Um, it's an amazing place, and they're going to talk to us about how ancient Tucsonans modify their environment for productivity and sustainability. So welcome, Susie and Paul Fish. Thanks for being here. Uh, 
Uh, this is what the floodplain of the Santa Cruz might have looked like if you had been there for these very early irrigation systems. This is on the Rio Sonora. Rio Sonora. Uh, and you can see there's the river, and here's a canal coming out. The fields are off the floodplain out of the flood zone. And these are just like the canals that are 3,500 years old. They operate solely by gravity. They're not mechanized in any way. People are still using them to, to feed their families. Okay, next. Um, we might have thought that the earliest agriculture in the Tucson Basin was very simple. You know, shorter canals than people built later, and you know, just overflowing the banks for watering. However, excavations along I-10 in the northern part of the Tucson Basin just incredibly luckily show us that that's not the case. The earliest fields we know about, the ones that are over 3,000 years old, were actually very complex and had infrastructure that had to be renewed constantly because they, these were in the uh, floodplain and they were flooded uh, quite often and had to be rebuilt. <coughs> so what we see are grids, and the grids are very important. They're earthen berms, and what they do is trap the water. They let out the irrigation water, and of course it runs off. They didn't have lasers to level their fields like we do today, so all these fields are somewhat uneven. So to keep the water in place, let it sink in, people made these earthen bermed grids in huge areas of them. Yeah. Susie, what's the scale? The scale would be, uh, these are people. Can you see those? Mm -hmm. I, I wish this were a little clearer. Those little ants? Those ants are people. <laughs> wow. Okay, so. What does that mean? Um, this is just a close-up of the grids over here. And what <coughs> I can't see very well, I'm afraid it's not projecting too well, is these grids aren't the whole, the whole story. Within each of these grids, there are actual planting holes for individual crop plants. So if you can see, what can you see, Paul? Can you see them? Uh, you can vaguely see them. Uh, I wish I could see them. And the lower uh, Something I can use corner. for a pointer. Um, can get a shower? Well, I have to, I need to get up to the shower. Yes, there we go. And there. I while well, we're taking a pause, uh, uh, the groups are about oh three to four meters on a side. So those, those squares, the, the 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 narrow areas are the actual canals. Okay, here is a canal coming into the field. It's elevated above the grid, grid so it lets the water out down onto the grid. It's elevated slightly. And there's and one right in the center. Of the there's grid. one right here going along. And uh, these are slices, stratigraphically separated stripe uh, slices that, was done, that were done with the backhoe. So sometimes the slice goes through the grid, and in this case it went through the planting holes. So here are the planting holes that are in the grids, but it was cut at just the right place only up here to have, say, the planting holes in the grid at the same time. So these people are doing everything possible to conserve the water that's let out into the fields and keep it in place and make the best use of it. Okay. And the white lines outline the berms? They, they outline the berms. Okay. They're urban berms. Right. <coughs> and um, they also outline this canal that's coming through. Yeah. Uh, this, it was incredibly lucky to be able to see this. The only reason the archaeologists could see this is because the fill in the, in the grid was a little bit different color than the berms. So, you know, you're just slicing through it and they're rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt as this area floods. They have to make the berms again and the planting holes. So it just depends on point of where the backhoe slices through it as you're going down that you see different parts of it at any given time. Okay, so and not only did they have canals, they had really quite complicated infrastructure in the fields to make the water uh, go in the farthest. Now, you've all probably have heard about the Hoakam in the Phoenix area, and they were the agribusiness people of ancient Arizona. <laughs> they, they, 
Zella Arch. They, uh, they built, the Hohokam there, built the largest canals in the New World north of Peru. So in all the New World, the largest canals were in the Phoenix Basin until you get down to Andean uh, <coughs> canals that come off the Andes and go out to the coast. Uh, this is the Phoenix area, Mesa, Scottsdale, Tempe. Uh, these canals covered the entire Phoenix metropolitan area. And when particularly settlers from the eastern U.S. got to Phoenix, they basically just cleaned out and rebuilt those canals for the first historic agriculture. You can still see them on the surface because they're so big. Uh, here is one, one segment of a canal that's preserved, and you can see where somebody's driven a car through it. And here's one in cross-section, and actually there's another one over here. So these are huge canals, uh, as much as 10 meters across, and they carry lots of water. Okay. Uh, and they modified the environment to the extent that uh, these are the, the ancient canal lines, and you can see how the modern soil types follow the canals because the water is carrying a lot of soil from the river and it's in flood. So it has a lot of suspended particles. So basically you're getting alluvial soils from the irrigation water that goes out to the fields. See, they're irrigating downhill from the line. And so all of that irrigation is, is carrying suspended soil particles and nutrients out onto the fields. And of course, when they clean out these huge canals, that gets spread out too. So the modern uh, soil types actually reflect that ancient irrigation in the Phoenix area. Okay. Now, th this is Phoenix up here. Here's Tucson down here. And each one of these black dots is a large site late in Hohokam time with a platform mound. So these are the large sites and then there are a lot of smaller villages around each one. But this kind of helps you map where Hohokam populations were. And you can see where we had the Salt and Gila River, there are a lot of people with those huge canal systems in Phoenix. Down here, not so many because we don't have a big flat valley bottom and we don't have perennial rivers. So our irrigation was on a smaller scale and people did a lot of mixed techniques to make a living. So we're going to talk about this platform mound site here and the community. That's all the littler, smaller sites around it, right here, this one. Okay. I do. And this is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like if you'd been there at AD 1250. This is the platform mound. It's earthen. It has adobe walls. There's another wall around the top and four rooms on top. Uh, the people are living in compounds, which are also adobe, flat room buildings, uh, and they're, they're in sort of apartment complexes with 20 to 40 rooms inside the wall, and there are about you know, between 35 and 40 of these compounds at the site. So over a thousand people probably at this site. And this would have been a major center near Marana. Okay. So this is the platform mound site right here, the Tortellina Mountains across the valley to the smaller Tucson Mountains. Here's the river coming through, the Santa Cruz River, and that's, a, that's across the basin. So all of these sites were found by complete coverage survey going back and forth between the mountains. So we have the outlines of all the sites that were occupied about AD 1250 to 1300, somewhere in there, uh, in this area. And at the center of this, this distribution is the mound site, the biggest one. Okay, uh, next. This is a cross section through the community, an elevational cross section. And what we want to tell you here is how people use the entire basin. They weren't just irrigators, they didn't just live along the river, they lived everywhere in the Tucson Basin. We'll try to describe that to you, and we're using that Marana community that we located all the sites in uh, to illustrate it. So the Santa Cruz River, the Tortellis that are a lot bigger, and the Tucson Mountains that are smaller. Okay. All right. So this would be right down here at the floodplain along the Santa Cruz. And this would be the 
scale of farming and irrigation. And this is a diversion, and this is how people took water off the river. And again, this diversion is, in, is on the Rio Sonora right now, uh, but it's the same kind of technology people used in the past. And I wish this were projecting larger. This is a diversion that washes out in floods and then it's rebuilt. And it consists of stakes stuck in the bed of the river, and then they weave brush in between and pack dirt up on it. And that is how they, they put that out into the river and divert water into the canal. And uh, it works pretty well, sometimes better than, than modern uh, cement uh, diversions or dams because uh, it washes out when a flood comes along. So all the water doesn't go into the canal system and, and wash it out. So this breaks away in a flood and the canal system stays intact. Um, so this, this is a diversion for about this scale of irrigation system. It's all gravity, people are still using it. And it, and it matches some of the canals that archeologists have found in excavation. Okay, now, that's what they're doing down here at the valley bottom. We're going up to the next uh, area of low slopes, and that's where drainages bring suspended sediments out in floods out of the mountains and start to deposit them right before the flood plain where the valley slope flattens out. So when water slows down, it drops soil. And you get alluvial fans and you get people doing floodwater farming on these alluvial fans. What is flood water farming? It's seasonal, seasonal water after big storms. The water brings the fertilizer with it. It's all this suspended topsoil and, and organic matter from the flood running along the slopes. And the people who are still doing flood water farming put up a brush diversion. They put it up in a dry arroyo and they wait for a summer storm. So they're prepared, again, uh, these are stakes stuck in the river bread and brush and off in earth. So they wait with their diversion until there's a big storm, the dry arroyo runs with flood water, it's diverted off to the side into a ditch, and it goes out to their fields. That's another diversion. You can see in this dry arroyo, you can see back here, this is the corn that's being uh, grown using these diversions. So we have flood water farming all over that upper zone above the flood plain. And, uh, and uh, we cannot find remains of this because it doesn't preserve, but we have the sites in that zone, the residential sites in that zone of the farmers who are doing this. And flood water fields are not just tiny isolated fields, they're often a big series of them in the past. And um, <coughs> you can see that that's what a landscape of flood water fields looks like. This is out by Oregon Pipe, and this is another part out west on the uh, Nation. So you can't see these anymore because people pretty much stopped doing this by the mid-80s. But we still have photographs and records. And actually, um, many of you know the name Gary Nadkin, and he, his dissertation was on flood water farming in the mid-80s. And he was there just about at the last time people were still doing this in a big way, although there's very much interest in bringing it back. Okay, so flood water farming is not totally small scale, and it produces a lot of crops as well. Okay, so then we're going up the slope again. We're in the middle of the valley slope. There's no water. Water's running underground um, in the drainages. So what can people do? Uh, to have some productivity there. Well, this again are all, these are all the sites in the Moronic community, and these, just in zone two, as we call it, are the ones that are producing agave. Um, and we'll show you how people do that. So they're, they're quite clustered, and there's small ones up in here as well. And that's a major part of the production, but not with irrigation or flood on dry slopes. Um, this is just a valley being grown in, in stone terraces in Mexico, just our analogy to show you that people are still doing this today. today. This is further south in Mexico, uh, that's in the state of Hidalgo. But all of those black 
blocks we saw that were site outlines on the Mid-Valley Slope looked like this when you mapped them. Each one of those dots is a rock pile. That's why we call them rock pile fields. And uh, the linear ones are like little contour terraces of stone and check dams and small, very small drainages. And in the middle of these fields are big roasting pits. They're still there, and that's how we can confirm what they're growing, because they are full of charred agave and fuel wood, because you have to cook the agave to process it. So this, these are modern agaves we planted in a prehistoric feature. Uh, we were experimenting to see how it all works, and so there's each little tiny dot up here is actually one of these. We don't know. Um, and I, I'll try to, I, I need to keep going because I'm not going to get through this, I don't. Uh, but I'll try to answer the questions and maybe we can have some more. Um, we do not know because we very seldom get reproductive parts. And when you have a harvesting agave, if you want to eat it, you harvest it before the big stalk goes up. Because that big stalk uses all the stored carbohydrates from the whole life of the agave. So if that stalk goes up, people can't have that food to eat. So it's harvested before it makes fruits and flowers. And we know that we need reproductive parts for taxonomic identification. So the two things that archaeobotanists have looked at to figure out which agave it is is uh, spines, which, which which get charred spines out of the roasting pits. But they are not, uh, they don't give you species, unfortunately. They can give you groups of species, but they can't give you a species. And then the other thing that some are, a few archaeobotanists have looked at are cuticle patterns. And again, you cannot get to species. So without the reproductive parts, we can only give you groups. Now, we think that Agave murphii, and I'll show you later why, one of the reasons, is the major one. It was grown in the low basins, not necessarily everywhere. And people probably grew several species because they wanted food, fiber, and alcohol. And different species have different properties. Okay, so here is a roasting pit where they're roasting the harvested agave with all the leaves cut off. And I'm cheating, this is in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're actually going to make them stop. <laughs> so here's the roasting pit, and you can see it's smoking out. This is the equivalent in the Marana community. The roasting pits are still out there, they are huge. We have one that's the biggest one we have found, it's 35 meters in diameter, and they were used year after year after year, and farmers shared them. So people roasted their agaves together, probably a cult with fuel efficiency, so everyone didn't have to go out and pick a pit and get the wood. So this is an archaeological pit in those fields I showed you, and you can see it's full of ash, and we can tell you the wood species people were using, because archaeobotanists have identified the little bits of charcoal, and sometimes when we're lucky, we actually get big char pieces that are, you know, we can tell what the anatomy is, like the spines. So that's how we can say, in those rock pile fields, the product was um, Okay, so it's gone. Now, uh, some of you may not know that you can eat roasted agave. Uh, and people like it, it's very sweet. And that's in Wymus, and we've seen it in Altar, and where else have we seen it in lots of places? Oh, oh. Where, you know, they're actually they're not roasting it right in Sonora, they're bringing it up in trucks from places like Guadalajara. <coughs> where they're making um, mezcal and, and tequila. But people who are making uh, mezcal bacanora, you know, eat it sometimes too. And it's very sweet. And so these are pieces of it that are being sold as a sweet. And it's very fibrous. And you have to chew it up and you spit the fibers out. You okay. can buy it at AJ's if you go to the produce so. <laughs> the, the buyer from AJ's is from Guadalajara. He always has a little bit out in the tropical and fruits. And you can see it, but it's, it's usually kind of old. And, you know, it's virgin on the wall. It's as good as, as the, the fresher ones. And of course, because there's this huge um, heart full of sugars, 
it is fermented and we know what happens then. <laughs> and we think the prehistoric people also made a wine-like beverage. Uh, they certainly used alcoholic beverages in this part of the Southwest. You've heard of the Saguaro wine in Germany, for instance. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, now the other thing we want a dog is for is fiber. And again, we're in we're in Hidalgo, where people are still making a lot of fiber products. And this man is scraping off the pulp to expose the fiber from the leaf. Uh, this is, these are bigger bodies. And there's the fiber grind, and you can make pulp, you can make ropes, sandals, uh, baskets, anything that you can use kind of coarser fiber for. Okay, so it's an incredible plant. All right, so here is the floodwater farming. Here is the um, um, agave fields. And if you go up the slope a little further, and nobody's growing anything, but they're intensively harvesting the abundant saguaro. And they actually have saguaro camps today. You, can, you may have seen some with the desert um, museum. Um, but people are gathering the saguaros. This lady's making actually some water to get them for some syrup. And there's one of the camps. And Dan is on these camps and they go back every year. And they use a lot of pottery to process the saguaro, into, especially into the syrup. And so we get these sites in that part of the valley slope that have just lots of pottery from broken jars and very little else. Because nobody's living there. They just go there for a couple of weeks every year to harvest the saguaro. Okay, so now we're going back up to the, the final zone, and people are floodwater farming again, where the drainages come out from the mountains over the pediment, which is the stone that made the mountain, or the bedrock. Uh, the water is kept high, and people can floodwater farm again. So this is part of the Marana community, where that would be possible, and again, we're using an ethnographic floodwater diversion. Okay. So we've gone through the whole area. So people aren't just living on the river, they are living everywhere and they are producing something throughout the basin, from mountains to mountains. Okay, now we're coming to Tumamak, which is our major example tonight, and all those zones are very compressed. Okay, here is the river and the floodplain over here. Here's Tumamak Hill, which has these high slope resources, and here is what we call the the slope of Bahada that comes out from Tumamak going over to Greasewood. This is Pima Community College up here. Okay, so everyone's oriented, right? Okay. So we're going to talk about floodplain. What would the floodplain have been like? So, uh, on, on the canal, on, on that left side there, mm -hmm. um, <coughs> are those red lines on the Oh, no, those are not. Those are what? This is modern. These streets. Okay. Yeah. This, um, I'm just trying to this orient you with the, you know, the modern landmark. So Pima Community College, Bruce Wood, Tumamak Hill. This is the road going up to the top of the hill where people walk. And this is the Santa Cruz over here and the, and the floodplain. So Mission Gardens would be up here and all. Okay? So everyone's all right. Okay, so this is an 1852 sketch of the floodplain looking out from Tumamak, from the top of Tumamak, and what are we sitting? Well, it looks sort of like those other floodplain landscapes we've seen. And all the, here, here is just the, the historic stuff that we've all spread away and had to reconstruct. Um, and here are these fields, and they all have these fence rows. Pay attention to the fence rows, they're very important. Okay, and this is on the Rio Moctezuma, and you're looking down from a hill onto the floodplain. Uh, the young lady who took this photograph is sitting in the back row a week ago. And this is the floodplain of the Rio Moctezuma, and what does it look like? It looks like Tucson's floodplain in 1852. People were still using gravity irrigation, still using it here uh, to some extent now. There's some pumping in these areas, but uh, these are largely the same kinds of layouts and landscapes. Okay, and look at the fence rows. You might call them hedge rows. They're very important. Okay, but why are those so important? Well, think about it. 
People have been living and farming in the exact same parts of the Tucson Basin on the floodplains for 4,000 years. What's gone? Wood. If, you, if people have been living in the same place for 4,000 years and they do all their cooking and they all fire all their pottery with wood, it has to be carefully <coughs> shepherded, right? So, what do we see in traditional fields? We see fence rows. These are, you see these trees all have trunks about the same level. They were all planted at once. They're cottonwoods and willows. And they were intentionally planted along the edge of the field. And brush was woven in between. And they're called living fence rows. And what they do is break when this river that's going by here floods onto this field, those trees and their roots break the force of the flood, they slow the water down, and it deposits what the farmer calls agua puerpa, piggy water, all over the fields. And that's how the fields are flooded, are fertilized. So it's not just about water, it's about fertilizing. And that's why people never have to fertilize these kinds of fields. Okay, so there's all these trees along here, and they're called living fence rows, and there are publications on them. Um, here's a canal coming along this edge of the field, and again, you see uh, larger vegetation is supported from the seepage. These are unlined canals. Water seeps out to the side, and the water seeps out, and so there's vegetation along the side of the canal that's living on that water. And so in this case, again, you see larger trees. And actually, there's a prickly pear right there, too. And there are some other things here. Um, but in any case, those are very important. This is a scene I really like because it illustrates what canals do as well in terms of modifying the landscape to give people resources they need. Well, I'm walking along beside this farmer, and he is telling me why this canal, you see this break in the vegetation, the vegetation floor along here? This, it has a canal that's running along this sort of, just the very edge of a, of a hill. And on the downside, there's all this herbaceous and shrubby vegetation that's living from the, the seepage out of the canal. And he very cleverly planted all of his fruit trees along the upside of the canal so that that was watered with a seepage out of the canal. Plus, if you think about it, when runoff comes down this hill and hits the canal in, in a big storm, it could wash out. But if you have your trees planted along the upside, then their roots stabilize that canal. So he's watering his fruit trees, He's creating all this vegetation down here that is probably going to feed his animals. And it's because he has an unlined canal that lets out a lot of water into the soil going right along here. So, you know, things that look kind of natural to us and that we don't understand, uh, if you ask the farmers, they will tell you exactly why it's done the way it is. And it, it is, you know, it's a long tradition in this part of the world. Okay, next. All right, so we talked about, I'm sorry, this is really big wood. I couldn't find small wood. Fence rows give those farmers wood. And every time you see somebody walking out to their field, and you see them walk back home, they often have some dead branches with them because they need fuel to cook and do other things. And what else do these irrigated fields give besides crops? Field leaves. Now, we think, we have in English the word weed. We don't think much of weeds, and we would get rid of them in most cases. However, uh, things like these amaranths that grow all over the place, where there's a little irrigation, extra irrigation water going out to the side of the field, they can be eaten as greens, and they, the seeds can also be eaten. And those are just one of the kinds of, of weeds that people eat. So aside from the crops, very important in irrigated areas that water that's gone through the field and is coming out at the edges also is supporting edible weeds. Okay. 
Uh, this is a, a sort of a landscape of irrigation, <clears throat> uh, earlier part in the 1900s on the Kilo River Indian community. And you can see it right now, and look at look at the hedge, the fence row right here, or hedge row, whatever you want to call it. Wood, things you'd like to eat, like wolfberry, um, hackberry, weeds. And if you want to hunt rabbits, where would you go? To the fence rows. If you wanted to hunt songbirds, which little boys with sing slingshots do to add protein to the diet, you go to these fence rows. They are all purpose larders or store storerooms for the people who are also growing things in the food. Next. All right. All right, we've done the club plan over here. Now we're going to look at this part of the tumor right here. So uh, here's the hill, and we're just talking about this little part over in here. Um, well, we find terraces and rock piles. So people are using the water that's coming down off the hill after a rain. Anything you can track around is useful. So you walk right out to that part of the tumor property, and these are all over the place. Little contour terraces with the rock piles. Little mulches. Okay. Next. Okay, so we have that little corner of the, of the Tumuma property. Okay, so here's the hill. Hema College up here, Greasewood. Okay, we're now going to look at what happens with these drainages. Did you ever think of these drainages as producing something that are off to the west or north of the hill? Okay. Well, here is one of those floodwater diversions in uh, northwest Sonora. And look at this little dry drainage. Dry most of the year till it rains. And here's one of those brush diversions. Here's the cornfield back here. Well, look at these two drainages. Obviously, you could do the same thing there. And again, they have big watersheds off to the west. They're draining the slopes. They're carrying, after a rain, water and suspended topsoil and nutrients. They're exactly what you want on your field. And the other really great thing about them is they're shallow. Because if you want to put up a brush dam, you can't do it in a big, incise drainage. The shallower, the better to get the water out to the side to use. And sure enough, uh, Owen Davis and some other people have found corn pollen in the sediments out there, uh, which are undoubtedly from floodwater farming. Okay, this is a wonderful, it's on a calendar by an um, artist named Michael Chiago. And this is what they think floodwater farming is looking like. So we're talking about little streams and people breaching them and pulling them out to the side with shovels and early burns. So Tumamak probably looked like that when, when they were in use. Okay? <coughs> Harvesting the crops from them. And look what we have again in those floodwater fields. Lots and lots of amaranth and other weedy things that you could eat if you liked amaranth. Okay, so there's the crop, there's the rest, the weeds. Okay, so now we're going to look, again, out here. This is, this is coming down to the drainage across from Pima Community College. And next. Okay, it's full of rock piles and terraces. And these are kind of informal things. People just pile up rocks. And if you look at all the annuals growing in this rock pile, annuals love rock piles, and we'll talk about why. Here's a bigger rock pile, here's a terrace, another thing. The whole area back there has been manipulated. The rocks have been moved around and for birds. They want the water. They want the runoff after a rain. And they're going to plant a office. Okay, next. And I'm sorry, this is a little dim. Okay, here's Anklum Road right here. 
And this is a map of just a segment of that area, just west of us. Okay, each one of these is a rock pile. The dotted lines are the terraces. And you can see water's coming down this way and it's trapping the water after a rain and saving it a little longer than it would be here before. And what is this? This is a great big grocery here. Just like those ones we saw before. There are several of them out there. Okay. So what is it about these rock piles? Why are they so good? Well, here's one cross section. There's actually some dirt mounted up under the rock pile. And um, this is just some studies we've done trying to figure out more about them. Basically, they're mulches. When the water's running off across the desert surface, these are like kind of little spongy things sticking up. They have a broken surface so the water can penetrate as it cannot do on the flat soil, especially if it has a clay content. So they're kind of, think of them as little sponges sticking up there for, for runoff. But the other thing they do is, you know, water gets to the surface and evaporates through capillary tubes, little tubes form in the soil. Well, what happens if you put a rock on top of it? That water vapor cannot go up through the capillary tube and disperse at the surface. So these are just mulches, like you would use a mulch anywhere. It keeps water in the ground in that spot. So it absorbs it better than the desert soil around it. It um, keeps the, the water in the soil underneath it. And we, we've done a number of studies, and others have as well. Um, here is an agave we planted in a rock pile. Look at all these annuals and, and perennials that want to live in a rock pile that has extra moisture. So we took control areas outside the rock piles and rock piles, and we uh, dug up the soil and sifted out all of the roots because we were going to look at root biomass as a measure of how much better plants could grow in the rock piles than outside in the control areas. And we used the roots instead of just counting the plants because we wanted to get both annuals and perennials, and so the annuals aren't always there. So when we found out that root biomass under the rock piles and terraces is 80% greater than in our control areas. So that's kind of a measure of plant response still. Plants like rock piles and they like the water. So that lets people bring these agaves, which are naturally growing at higher elevations, down to the low hot basins and it gives them enough more water to let them survive in, in an environment that would not be where they would naturally. Yeah. So do you think that there's any reduction in the landscape around and displacing the rocks in the surrounding landscape? Uh, certainly uh, they did pile up the rocks and these rocks are on the surface naturally. They're not bringing them from a distance. They're, they're just concentrating them. So yes, it would be some difference in the, you know, in the surface characteristics around them. Uh, they are still there today. All the natural vegetation is growing around them, and um, that's. But but the plants do prefer these spots, um, and they also catch soil that's run in runoff as well. So they get the nutrients, water absorption, penetration, and they keep the water there once it's in. So we put these little, these have, uh, these are PVC pipes with caps. We had boycos blocks that measure soil moisture buried down there. And we had to put the leads that come up, the electric leads that come up in the PVC pipe because the pack rats stole it. <laughs> and so we came along with our uh, meters and read soil moisture. So we and a number of real soil scientists have done studies showing that in fact there is greater moisture retained for days or weeks, depending on how much rain there is, under these rock piles and terraces. It's measurable, it's quantifiable. But I think if you want to know what the plant thinks, the fact that there's 80% more root biomass under them is a very, very telling number. Okay, so we, we read the moisture. And a oh, um, uh, person named Karen Riker actually did transects across rock, rock piles and out in the control areas and just counted in and it was 
course, there are many, many more open in the long term. So any way you look at it, that's the best place for folks to grow. Here are some of the goblets um, that we planted, and it took 25 years to flower. Uh, and that's what we wanted to find out. Now, most farmers don't want to wait 25 years, right, for a harvest. And we found out that just by putting them in there and leaving them alone, you had to wait 25 years to get it ready to flower, which is when you harvest it before you, before it flowers, when it is. And so we also learned then how you have to uh, cultivate a garden and rock piles. Okay, uh, we also found that when it got very dry, rodents and rabbits and everything else started nibbling on them. They were, you know, they were starving in a very dry summer. And the roots of the agave are sweet. They don't have those horrible, nasty chemicals in them like the leaves do. So they try to tunnel, tunnel under to the roots. And actually, when that happened, the agave survived much longer that were in the rock piles than the ones that weren't because it inhibited the rodents digging down under there for the roots. Okay, next slide. Okay, now, why do you have to cultivate a dollar in rock piles? Why can't you just stick them in there and walk off? You don't have to weed them. Um, all right, we only planted one agave in every rock pile. Well, what do they do? Agaves are stressed at low elevation. It's not where they grow naturally. Uh, if you think about when you're going up Mount, Mount Lemon, when do you first see agaves? You know, maybe Molina Basin, a little lower. Okay, so these have been brought down. They're a somewhat higher <coughs> elevation desert plants, although they are drought adapted. Um, under stress, they start reproducing vegetatively. So every single agave we planted started suckering madly. And you know, all those little pups are on the same root system. So when the agave reproduces vegetatively, and you get those little suckers, like these, they're all the place. We counted up to 70 suckers on one agave. When that happens, it's, it's using up its nutrients, and it is not maturing for harvest. So if you want to harvest your agave in a reasonable amount of time, you have to pull those suckers off so they're not competing for nutrients. And the main agave will go ahead and grow big and get ready to reproduce. So you ha they have to be cultivated. People have to do something to them. And uh, you know, one will have dominance. Usually, it's the one that we planted in the beginning. But you get a bunch of them growing large. And in a wet summer, they'll just sucker, 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 and then it gets dry again. And some of those suckers will dry up, die off. And so it's not an efficient use of the plant's uh, resources. So we didn't do it, we wanted to see how it worked. But clearly, you had to pull off the, the suckers from the roots to get your original plant, or a few original plants, to go ahead and flower or mature. That's what you want them to do. However, every one that did finally flower, there was another one waiting in the wings from a sucker. So once you plant these, you have to pull off the cups, but you probably don't have to replant. In every cup you pull off, you can put in another crop top. So it's really efficient once you get them grown. I mean, they're a little bit fragile down in the hot basin. They get a little bit more moisture from the water, uh, but then they become self-perpetuating. And you might have three or four in a rock pile of different ages so you could harvest them over several years. They wouldn't all mature the same year. Because you want to harvest as many times as you can. So you would probably have your original one that's the biggest and pull out some uh, that are real small, have another fairly large one, and maybe one or two other fairly large ones. And you would stay here the harvest year. Okay. okay. So we're again talking about this area with all the rock piles and terraces. Okay, next. And having them out there, they are taking up some of the runoff. They can't get it all. But in that same area, people who live here could harvest all those other things that were growing out there. Uh, mesquite along the washes. 
prickly pear, choya bugs, saguaro fruits. So having all those rock piles and terraces out there didn't mean that people couldn't also get wild resources from the same land. Okay. Now, you know, it's very hard to know whether some plants are cultivated or whether they're just growing out there wild. And you know, people are going to use them either way. Corn is easy. We don't see wild corn out there. We just see domesticated corn. And that's because in the process of domestication, corn has changed morphologically so that we know it's different from its wild ancestors. So when we see domesticated corn, no question, we know it's being cultivated, right? Because it can't live by itself. Not so with agave. Why? Who can think of a reason why? Why can you not tell a cultivated agave from a wild one? Because you plant a clone. There is no genetic change. So people in Mexico who plant agaves commercially sometimes get those, those little pups, little suckers from wild agaves. Sometimes they get them from cultivated agaves. They can go back and forth. We cannot tell by looking at the burned plant whether it was cultivated or not. But we can if we find it in the field and we have those roasting pits for charred agave. So in terms of the past, we have to have this other evidence. We can't just look at the burned plant as if it were a burned corn crop. Okay, so what is cultivated? Do we know? Well, there's a wild plant, right? What's that? Prickly pear. And I can tell you that hundreds, literally, of archaeobotanists have found charred prickly pear seeds in archaeological sites and said, ah, a wild resource. People were gathering this. Well, let's go over here. This lady uh, who lives, uh, uh, lived on the Hano Ada Reservation found a prickly pear out there, you know, a wild one. It had really great big fruits that tasted very good. And what did she do? How do you plant a, a, a prickly pear? It's a clone, just like a dog. You get a pad and you stick it in the ground, right? So this lady brought that home and had it in her yard so she didn't have to walk out there and compete with the birds and the environments for the right fruits. So we could say that's transplanted. Well, that's not really cultivated, right? That's just transplanted. How about this next thing? Well, this is in Sonora. And this is a cornfield. We know that's planted, right? We know that's cultivated. What are these little things down here? They look a lot less formal, but kind of irregularly pads of prickly hair stuck in the ground. Why, why did somebody do that? <laughs> Who's had no belief in Who's eating a prickly pear tuna? People do it all the time. They do it right here in Tucson. So in this case, it's not a wild resource, it's a crop. Oh, it's someone's cultivating it. Well, nobody doubts here. Those are prickly pears in rows. So that's the civilized way to grow crops. And we know those are cultivated, right? And that's actually uh, in a series of very large fields in Baja, California. So we can look at a prickly pear and we can ask, is it a crop? Is it is today. And it wasn't the Spanish that brought that custom because there aren't any prickly pears in Spain. So that seems to be an idea from here in the New World. Okay, or it could be you know, a wild product. Okay, so which is it? If you can't tell by looking at the prickly pear seed because it didn't change morphologically with just domestication, we don't know unless we can find some proof that this culture didn't have. Past. Past. Okay, next slide. What is growing in that rock pile? A prickly pear. So is that cultivated or not? Well, it's not, because we know. We planted the agaves in that rock pile, and the prickly pear just wanted to grow there on its own. But it certainly lets us know that either possibility could be. And unless we knew if somebody planted it, grew there on its own, we would not know if it was cultivated or not. So these lines between crops and wild resources, as we see them in our own classificatory scheme, may not be the whole story. Okay, it surely, it surely is. Okay, so something else.
also was domesticated here. Uh, this is a famous Russian uh, student of domestication named Babilov. And he's out here looking at these huge double claws that the Tarno also uh, domesticated to have the claws for the baskets when they started selling in the market. And this is a domesticated one here, which you can tell because it has these white seeds and it's huge. So people domesticate things for lots of reasons. We cultivate them for lots of reasons. Okay? And I'm just going to end on scale. I've talked about all these things that people are doing to make their, their environment productive and sustainable. But what is the scale that they're doing it on? We have some clues. We've shown you the rock pile fields, and you can walk right out there and see them. But here's to some, here is Phoenix. And these are all places where archaeologists have found rock pile fields. They're not rare, they're not infrequent, uh, they're not always recorded because they're so ephemeral. Mm -hmm. Are they all associated with a hole? Um, no, it, it gets it gets a little fuzzy over here whether they're whole come or not. And, you know, there's kind of mixed cultural areas in that part, uh, and we don't we don't claim at all that whole come is only one who may have done this. It's just that we have more of this evidence right here. Uh, anyway, these are these are just coded for how many how many hectares of rock pile fields have been discovered. And many times archaeologists don't record them because they don't notice them or they don't think they're important. So these are only the ones that we have recorded. It's about 33 square miles of rock pile fields, but it's a minimum, minimum. The, the squares there represent um, just areas? Uh, yeah, the archaeologists have a grid they put on the state of Arizona mm -hmm. to name sites. So it would be Arizona B and then a number. And the ABCs are these grids, so you're just seeing grids. Abundant grid on a side. Yeah, so we just use that as an organizing way to say how many hectares in each area have been recorded. So yeah. what, what kind of uh, activity was going on in those areas? People live all over the place. <laughs> um, this, you know, all around Phoenix, where's Phoenix? Uh, yeah, there's things all around here. We have these are all the square black squares are all platform now, so that kind of gives you a, an idea of where people are living. That's there's all the irrigation here, but the rock pile fields out around the edges of the things basically. So they they go actually they go all the way down to the river, and you know these are just ones that have been found. So the scale of this is very large. It's a very clever idea and lost the solution. So they're obviously living all over. Do we have any way of uh, estimating the density of the resident population and the moving around the You know, I could ask five archaeologists that question, they'd all fight about it. The high the high estimate for the Phoenix Basin is hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand, because they had all that big scale area. Some people say it's 25,000. You know, it's very hard to count these things. But let me go on with this. Okay. It's almost time. It's time to go. Okay. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Remember these grids from these very early fields? Well, people are still using them. There's a nice little grid for some of these kind of beans. And same principle. Uh, this is out on the Tarno Autumn Reservation. So these elements of agriculture that change the landscape and make it more productive um, haven't gone away. People are still doing that. Um, same principle. Okay. But we're talking about scale. Next. This, these are grids gone wild. These are on the terraces of the Gila around Sapphire. These, these grids just cover, you know, these are trees. Next. These grids are everywhere. It, they're stone grids. In this case, the, the, the side of the grid is not an earthen burn, it's stone. It's just stone piled up. It was so useful to do this, to, to manipulate the water, keep it in place, let it sink in, that uh, people 
and wanted to augment the productivity, took huge efforts over time to just put these woods out everywhere on the Gila terraces. So scale, archaeologically, goes beyond what we can document today. Because people didn't think about the grocery store. They didn't have the cattle. <laughs> it's all plants. Okay, so that's the end.